Well, hello everyone out there in Woo! the family. Tonight we have a very special guest, Ben Calhoun, who's the independent Christian musician. He does solo work and he's also the front man for the group Citizen Way, if you have heard of that. Uh, during the program, we will bring up his Ben Calhoun website for you to look at and his citizenway.com website. But in the meantime, brother, let's get this show rolling and welcome aboard, bro. Hi, Lee. Great to see you again, buddy. Thanks for having me. You bet. Now, Ben and I made each other's acquaintance at the recent Orlando Prophecy Summit in Orlando, Florida, and I have really enjoyed getting to know this brother. You know, I think some of us, sometimes we sit back and we think, oh, yeah, these you know, the professional athlete Christians and the Hollywood Christians and, and the music Christians, you wonder, maybe some of you wonder if there's any depth in them. Well, I want to tell you something right now. I don't know personally many of those folks, but I got to know Ben. And, and folks, he is definitely a, a disciple of the last days. He's a lover of the prophetic word. He uh, senses and feels a lot of the same discouragements and compromises that we feel, mm -hmm. I think you are going to enjoy the conversation with Ben tonight. Woo! All right, brother, here's my first question for you. Here we Were go. Were you raised in a Christian home? Absolutely, and I'm really proud of it. My dad's a pastor. My mom's a full-time musician. Us three kids are all walking with the Lord and all the grandkids too, so praise the Lord. Well, then how did you become a, a born-again Christian? Were you a younger child, an older child? I have two really distinct memories. I went to a Petra concert, and I remember John uh, Schlitt, the lead singer, has become a friend of mine now, and I've told him this story. But he shared the gospel, and I went home. I was probably nine-ish, and I remember praying to the Lord, hey, I don't know what to do other than pray, but I want to follow you, Jesus. And then three years later... I got baptized. My dad shared the gospel at church, and I'd heard it before, but this time I could really tell the Holy Spirit was tugging on my heart. And so I went home after church, and I asked my parents to pray with me that sinner's prayer. And it was very simple. It was really a great moment. It was a sweet moment. And then I have, I still have this ring. I wear it on my right hand because its it doesn't knock the microphone. Guitars will pick it up if I put it on here. So my wedding ring and my baptism ring are on this hand. I always do that because I play guitar here. So those are two sweet moments about when I was a kid, nine and 13, that I chose inwardly when I was a kid at nine and the 13 publicly. You know, was there ever a time uh, as a believer, whether you were still in your teenage years or in your adult years, where you like took another step upward, where you thought, you know what, I'm not as serious and devoted as I want to be? Yeah. Actually, that same year I got baptized, my youth pastor, Pastor Nate Crandall. Hi, Nate. He challenged me at youth camp one summer to not have a girlfriend for an entire year, but instead to read God's word every day, all year long. It didn't matter what I read. It didn't matter how much I read. It just mattered that I read something. And I did it. I took the challenge. And uh, I it changed my life. It was It was great. I actually kept doing it until I met my wife seven years later, and she was the green light. We've been married for 20 years. Praise the Lord. So how did you and your wife meet? Judson University in Chicago. She had felt the Lord leading her there to study youth men, youth ministry. I was a senior. She was a freshman. She's older than me. But we met in the Upper Commons first day. What's interesting is I was playing soccer there, and I'm pretty sure this is the story. My coach and I were talking downstairs. So Judson has an amazing history of soccer teams. And our coach is the winningest coach in history, NAI history coach, Steve Burke. Hi, coach. And I went from going downstairs to tell him that I decided not to play this year because I really felt the Lord leading me to really focus on ministry and music that year. I had been touring in a band for three summers, and I really wanted to do more of that. Soccer wasn't going to be my long-term thing. He's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I am. He's like, well, come see me at the games. In fact, he's a missionary now. We've supported him for a decade. He's a wonderful man. But they won the national tournament that year for the sixth time. We went every year, and that was the year they won, my years. Well, I went upstairs from that meeting, and I met Allison. 
So wow. there was a deliberate sacrifice in my end. And that was one of the fun times where the Lord's like, now I can open up a new door. So we started dating just a few weeks after that, really. And we got married in less than a year. That's an amazing story. And I like your illustration, too. Uh, there's so often in the Christian walk, we face a difficult decision. We work our way through it. We make the right decision. And when we follow through, that door closes and another one opens. And it's a Amen. door of blessing. Yep, always. And I, I always go back to what my dad says. And then what my friend Tom Spaulding says, my dad always said, son, God's the best general you'll ever have. Just follow the orders. The only way to know the orders is to read the book. Do what the book says, you'll be fine. Bloom where your plan is, stick with your strengths. And then my friend Tom Spaulding, he always says, you have to be led by the Holy Spirit. And unless you know how to hear his voice, you're just wandering around. So that's what I've tried to do ever since I was a kid. Now, I find it fascinating that you have gone forth in the music ministry and maintained a, a devoted walk with the Lord. When I was a young believer, I was really torn. Um, I love music. I was learning piano. I was working on the, the six string, uh, the steel string guitar. And I love both instruments. And, and I had some natural abilities there. But I was also deeply, deeply invested in my studies in Greek and Hebrew and the languages. And I finally concluded, do you know what? I think most of my friends that are also interested in music are better at this than I am. <laughs> so I'm just going to focus on the Greek and Hebrew. But I'm so blessed that brothers like you and, and sisters out there, too, have pursued music because it is so vital to the work of God. Yeah, I think it's powerful. Well, music is powerful. I'm always reminded of the story where King David, when he was a boy, played for Saul on a 22 string, I'm guessing, harp, one for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and the evil spirits left Saul. I mean, there's power there. I think it's very important to know how to use power. It's like a sword, you know? It's sharp for a reason, but if you don't know how to use it, I mean, you can cut somebody else or so, or yourself in a bad way. And I think a lot of the modern day church doesn't know how to wield that. In my opinion, it's really about knowledge of God's word. Amen. There's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, feeling led worship music, a lot of feeling led churches out there. Uh, and they, they tend to be not interested in the word. They have a very similar, I've played on over 3000 churches and it's an incredible education on the nature of man, uh, the nature of, you know, ministries, the nature of people who get paid to minister, people who do it for volunteers, uh, as volunteers. There's an incredible education there. And I've just noticed over the years, especially in my opinion, the church of Laodicea age that we're in, the mile wide and inch deep, you know, you really have to be careful that as a young believer, because a lot of what we're being fed these days from the mainstream Christian uh, you know, world is, is, is pretty fluffy. And a lot of it is almost true. And that I think is, it's easy to do good versus evil, but truth versus almost the truth is a lot harder to discern. And so a lot of baby Christians out there don't know because they're not being taught God's word. They're just going by whatever the next saying or worship song is or the next book or movie or whatever it is. And I've heard people in our in our fan base from from the crowds or, you know, after a show, they'll literally say, I got to get my fix on Sunday morning. You know, it's kind of like a drug. They go from one roller coaster to the other. And so I've just noticed that over the years, really solid, um, mature believers don't really they're not attracted to that type of thing. It's just an interesting observation I've made. And I'm always attracted to people a lot smarter than me. Hence, Lee Brainerd. <laughs> you know. You you touched on this when it comes to music, and I think it's really important. So many people today, the music they listen to, you've got emotions that completely overwhelm the rational, uh, logical aspects of of the music. And ideal music is is when the the melody, the harmony, and the lyrics are perfectly matched. That neither overpowers the other. They, they embellish each other. They encourage each other. And we need to, to get this concept 
of sound doctrine and sound thinking and, and good expression back into much of the music world. Absolutely. And, and music seems to be the thing that attracts most people. What's interesting is when people ask me, you know, what do I need to do to get into the music ministry? I said, you need to study the Bible. Very simple. I mean, you worship music is fairly simple. It's by design, right? So you can learn four chords and a capo and you can play most anything if you're, you know, you're good at it. But really, I think it's important that you know the word as a worship leader because you're going to be able to decipher what is true versus almost truth in a lot of the songs. My brother's great at that. My brother's a full-time worship leader at a church in Wisconsin. And he sometimes will change the words of a worship song that's very popular because he's like, it's not, it's not right on. We need to change this. So, or he'll write something. And so I think it's really important for young people and anybody in the artist to do two things. You have to know the word. And also really simply don't worship the worship leader. Yeah. Don't worship the worship leader. It's very common. I remember going, <laughs> I love my friend, <laughs> my friend Danny Goki. So we were on tour years ago. I love Danny and his wife, Leah said, good people. Well, we were, we, after a show, this lady came up to us. We had our tables next to each other. It's a big show. And she had a tattoo of Danny on her back. And she was just over the moon to meet him and all that kind of stuff. And he, you know, it's just one of those things where it's like people can sometimes default to worshiping people instead of the creator. And I think that's an important aspect for any disciple of Jesus, but especially for those in leadership. You know, Paul, I think, says it best, correct me if I'm wrong, but follow me as I follow Christ. Absolutely. I think, I think that's a really good way for anybody in ministry leadership to kind of just, that's kind of a hallmark. Follow me as I follow Christ. And then if you don't know the word, it's hard to know who Christ is. It's hard to know who Jesus is. And so I think a lot of worship music, um, there's other aspects to it. Worship music, you know, it not only is it very popular, but it does make a lot of money. And so it, it does tend to really muddy the waters there. Ministry and music, in my opinion, is can be very messy. And so I think it's really important for worship leaders to know the word more than anything. You can be a great musician, but if you know the word, the Holy Spirit will do everything. What does the Bible say? If Jesus, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men into me. It's his job, right? We, we get to point people to Jesus. And so music is one of the best and most powerful ways I've ever found. I mean, I can't do my taxes, but I can do a song and I'm always trying to cram God's word in there uh, there's a song I just finished tonight with a video that my brother and I, we did with our whole family. So you'll see it in a couple of weeks. Um, it'll probably get shadow banned because it actually mentions pro-life in the prologue, as well as the first line of the song is, they say you weren't planned. And I sent it to my radio promoter that I've worked with for many years. And she's wonderful. But, you know, it's interesting that she mentioned it probably won't work on Christian radio because it's so... Um, hot you know they say you weren't planned and i said no problem i understand but uh, you know internally i went i'm going to do it anyway because there's there's an aspect of the words are powerful you know god said let there be light his words we're reflecting off of our, us his a, as a creator him as a creator and so i think words are important and if you don't know the truth you're not going to be able to sing it either you know no amount of awesome music can ever overtop you know the truth. And I think a lot of modern worship music these days, we call them seven eleven songs in the industry, seven words, 11 times. And after studying, you know, a, a lot, and this is not a slam, it's just an observation. Okay. It's interesting to me that they sound kind of like a seance. It's a lot of repetition, a lot of meditative state. And I understand that there can be some good there. I really do. I understand it. But I think a lot of people don't know the word these days in America, particularly. That's what I know. And I can see where they are really skating on thin ice. And a lot of it is kind of like sugar. And you can't live off of sugar. You know, we do the hymns in our home church because they're so full of doctrine. And I, I just love that. So wherever I go, if I'm asked to lead... As I did at Prophecy Watchers, I love leading with the hymns. Yes. Not only the great lyrics, but the melodies are wonderful too, and everybody knows them, and they feel refreshed singing them. And I think it's there's an aspect of the Holy Spirit moves in His words, and I think the hymns are more conducive to having them. Yes, you know, if we had uh, more of that deep 
doctrinal biblical truth that's in the hymns in the contemporary music scene, that would be a tremendous blessing. That would be a game changer. Yeah. And there's a lot of artists out there who do it, a lot of worship leaders, a lot of churches. It's awesome. It's just interesting that the industry tends to go to more of a all are welcome at the table, as big of a net as you can get. And when you do that, in my experience, I've noticed that it tends to be not as deep, yep. you know. So, so how did you get involved in music ministry? Well, when I was a kid, I saw my mom on stage. My dad was a pastor. My mom's a musician. And they took us to Carmen and Petra and Jeff Moore in the distance. And I'm like, that's what I want to do. And I've been there ever since. So when we got signed to a label, we were already a band for like eight years. Wow. You know, playing every youth group and retreat and sharing the gospel. And I would memorize as many kids as I could at their names and call them out from stage because I wanted to minister to them. And it's a really easy way to do that when you know somebody's name. So I would do that all the way through our career. And I've just really enjoyed that. Um, you know, in 2019, when I came off the road because Liv was born, we got dropped by a label. The guys left the band. And I was just like, you know, I could keep going. Like it wouldn't, I could just no problem keep going. But I decided to hang up my cleats for at least for a season and maybe even indefinitely because I knew that you cannot raise a family and be gone 200 plus days a year. You can't do it. And there's a season for that. And I had finished my season and it was time for me to sacrifice my career for my family. And so I'm glad I did that. That was four years ago, five years almost. So what is your vision uh, for music ministry in the future for yourself? Well, for me, it's always what God's word says. Always. It's the same thing. It's so easy. If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. I remember when we got signed, my dad said, son, you know, you're, I don't know if you realize this, but you're in full-time ministry. And I think it was even before that. And it kind of dawned on me like, oh yeah, I, I am. You know, I since now have my preaching license and ordination, but I realized that it was a choice I had made when I was a kid. I wanted to serve the Lord. Um, and I think the future is always going to be the same. It's always been that way. The Great Commission, go make disciples. Use your strengths to point people to Jesus. If I be lifted up, I will draw them into me. So every song, whether it be country or independent or citizen way or whatever, I try to point people to the truth of God's word and let the Lord take it from there. His word Amen. doesn't return void, so I use it in every song. Amen. So now I've... On your website, the Ben Calhoun website, you mention a couple of different ventures that you've started that you're involved in, kind of ministries. Do you want to tell us a little bit about them? So obviously Citizen Way, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you can hear us on K-Love and any Christian radio station. Um, General Records is the record company I started to help artists. Now, the interesting thing about it is typically a record label will pay for everything. Well, I teach artists how to pay for their own music and then they own their masters. So I teach artists how to do the business. So it's, it's a label that doesn't own any songs other than what I do and put up there. I'm very proud of that. Uh, the other one is Generosity Rocks. It's a nonprofit fundraising platform for anybody in ministry. Primarily, it's been artists, but we've opened it up to speakers and YouTubers. And they can raise money on um, our platform. It's tax deductible for the donors. And then we handle everything for them. I also have a community there, and they can ask me and call me anytime on how to raise money. I've been raising money for our ministry for as long as we've been doing it, 20 years. you know. And even then, I toured in a band three years before that, and we still had to do it. So... When you're in ministry, you know, you're you're probably raising money in some way. I just learned to do it in a way I thought that was good. So what I what I ended up doing was everywhere with Citizen Way went, we would give 10% of our merchandise sales to a local ministry that night. We'd write a big check. Even if it was 50 bucks, 100 bucks, didn't matter. The fact is we highlighted a ministry locally. And then that opened the door for us to say, and if you'd like to continue to giving to our ministry so we can do this and keep making songs and feed our families, you can go to generositywrocks.com slash citizen way and donate. So now we have about 20 some artists that um, we serve. And I purposely don't advertise because I want the Lord to bring people who are really serving the Lord in ministry. I think there's a great revival on side note. Remember when the music industry for Christian music was young, 
you had the Larry Normans and then you had, you know, Res Band and you had Love Song and Annie Herring Green. and Second Chapter and Keith Green and all the early days. Well, it it's just interesting. There wasn't the same type of industry that we have now. And I think you're seeing a turn toward that because a lot of people, they don't fit the mold that is currently the industry. So they're just <clears throat> bypassing it all together and they're writing music that the Lord leads them to write. They're traveling. Maybe they don't fit on a Sunday morning worship team, but they're an artist nonetheless. And you're seeing a lot of on fire Christians wanting to share their testimony in song, not just a corporate worship song. That's fine. But songs that reflect their story that are a lot deeper, that take art and take depth to a new level. And I think you're going to see that again because it's forced to be that way, in my opinion. So I think the Lord just taught me how to skate where the puck was going. So that's why I started Generosity Rock, so I could help those artists. Well, amen. I'm so I'm so glad for that. You know, virtually everywhere I've been for the last two decades, I've run into people, whether they want to be preachers or whether they want to get involved in music ministry, they hardly know where to start. So if you were dealing with a young buck or a young lady and whether they wanted to get involved in music ministry or whether they wanted to to go forth and be involved in, in Bible teaching, what would be your advice to them? It's always the same. If I, I follow, I've said this for years, be fat, faithful, available, teachable, talented, and tenacious. Now, there, you have to have some God-given talent, right? But more importantly, when you're in ministry, it's, I really want to serve the Lord no matter what my gifts are. And then he tends to either highlight the ones he's given you or he gives you new ones. So for young people, you really need to know a few things. You need to know who your audience is. You need to be very specific on what you're doing with the resources you have and need to start yesterday. I, if you were a musician, I would totally, practically speaking, don't go to college. It's not going to help you unless you're going to be an educator or you're going to be in classical music. What you do is you just make a record and start playing it. That's how you do it. So musicians think I got to go get a degree or I got to go to this school because they have a great music program. To be frank with you, I've. I've recruited for Judson University for many years and started the recording arts program there. I saw a lot of kids come because they wanted to work on music, but they weren't really interested in school. And a lot of them never even finished. So I don't think it's as valuable as people think it is for musicians. I can speak to just musicians, unless you're going to be a teacher because you have to have a degree or you're going to be in classical music, which there are thousands of people fighting for that one job. Well, it's the same in the music industry, but I always tell people go buy a house, rent it out, Live in the other side, make a record, and start touring. That's how you do it. Maybe get involved at a church, too. Well, that's that's some great advice, and I think you could probably apply similar advice, uh, maybe adjust it a little bit, even to people that want to be preachers. Yeah, and, you know, unfortunately, there's a real stigma that comes with you have to have degrees behind your name and letters. You know, my dad's a, a doctor. He's been a pastor for 45 years, you know, seminary, got his doctorate. Now, that's awesome. That's totally legit. However, I just, I have to question sometimes, do you need that as to be a minister of the gospel? Every time I'm leading worship, I'll, well, a lot of times I'll say, you know, you don't have to be a pastor or to be a worship leader to serve or worship the Lord. Man, use the strengths God's given you right where you are, bloom where you're planted and let the Lord book you. He is a great booking agent, best I've ever seen. So I tend to go down that road. Like, don't keep waiting and waiting for a degree. It's not going to come unless you go do it. And your talent, you have to work at. It's not like God's going to bless you with all these songs. And honestly, I've seen a lot of people say, well, the Lord gave me this song. And I'm like, well, play it for me. Well, I got a cold. I'm like, so sing it anyway, you know? There's so much that goes into the fact that people, they, they will throw around that God told me card or God laid this on my heart. And I'm like, well, that's great, but the song isn't very good, in my opinion, or whatever. And I'm like, well, can you practice more? You know, so there's an aspect of don't over spiritualize everything because there are a lot of people who work really hard to get where they are and they're worth hearing. And some people, just because you think the Lord told you so, and a lot of times those people don't know the word, by the way. That's just what I've noticed over the years. They just get a feeling or, a, you know, some the Lord told me. So I'm like, well, maybe he didn't tell me, you know, <laughs> there's an aspect of that. I think that's really dangerous for young musicians. Know your stuff. Be amazing. John Schlitt from Petra told me that. 
He's like, if you're going to get up on stage, be the best in the room. That always stuck with me. Yes, yes. And he's if awesome. He, if anything is worth doing unto the Lord, it's worth doing in the way of excellence. I think of uh, hmm. Psalm 33, 3, is it? Do you see a man skilled in his work? He'll serve before kings, not obscure men. I believe that's a reference. Yep. And, you know, think of the Levitical priesthood. The musicians, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, they had to work for maybe 30, 33 years understudy to, before they could be a, a, a musician or a worship leader, and they had to make their own instruments. I think that's interesting. The numbers there, too, in the numerology. But I think that's a real testament to the fact that if you God has given you a gift, don't not only don't waste it, but be amazing at it. So I always yeah. tell young people, like, be the best in your your family, your youth group, your school, and then let, let it bloom from there. And a degree these days isn't really going to help you. You know, it's, it's interesting when you bring that up because I never did go to Bible school. Don't have one oh. day of Bible school under my belt, but yet by the grace of God, he led me in a path where I – was uh, self-educated in Greek and Hebrew and threw in a little Latin and Syriac along the way. And the Lord has blessed me immensely on that. I just, instead of putting a bunch of money in an institution, I put a bunch of money into a library and made the best of it. I think it was a little bit slower going because you don't have someone to hold your hand along the way. Mm. But in the long run, you're forced to, well, it's sink or swim. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, and honestly, anybody who's really skilled, any good leader, that's the typical story that I've seen from them. You either do it or you don't. There's no real in between eventually. You eventually have to pick something. Well, let's move over into the section or the area of facing hard choices. What is the hardest decision that you faced as a believer where you felt the tug between the way your heart wanted to go and the way you felt honored the Lord the most? Well, I, I've had a series of them. When I was seventh grade, chose to read God's word every day. And they weren't hard to choices, but I, I remember what was hard about them is, my, you know, my wife and I, we have, we've left a small group before. We left a church that, you know, she was attending. I was gone on the weekends. And it wasn't really, it wasn't a biblically based church. And it was not hard for me at least to leave. What was hard is losing friends. What was hard is losing social status. What was hard was trying to figure out how do you help your young kids understand why we're doing this? You know, why do we go to home church and study God's word instead of going to this big church where all of our friends are? Well, it's because they, they don't really preach the Bible. And what the Bible they do preach, we believe is heretical. So at some point, that was the hardest part. Um, the hard, uh, another hard part, you know, leaving the road in 2019. I, I would, I know I could have been bigger than we, we were. And yet I knew that if I would have kept marrying my career, I would have, my stuff, my family would have suffered. So I had to really just to make a choice. There was a fork in the road. Uh, you know, it's interesting. Another one, this new song we have coming out, it's called Perfectly Love. The first line is, they say you weren't planned. That line specifically was written um, by my friend James Stanley. And it was, it's, it'll get rejected from radio because of that, because it's too divisive. Christian radio, you know? Um, and I'm okay with that. So I, I can... I'm not going to change the lyric. I'm going to say, and we purposely say, this is a pro-life song. And so I don't think you can do anything other than stand on that as a follower of Jesus. Uh, and so though they're not hard, but what happens, the consequences from that are sometimes hard. Like we were shadow banned on all of our social media back in 2020 for voting for, um, well, you know, the name that shall not be mentioned and, and, <laughs> you know, voting pro-life and we were shadow banned on Facebook. I, nobody sees our posts anymore. We have 108,000 followers on Facebook and nobody sees anything, you know, compared to what it used to be. And I'm okay with that. I knew it would happen. I'm proud of the fact that my wife and I took a stand because I'm going to have to stand before the Lord someday Amen. and say, what did I do with my platform? Or he, he'll say, you know, we have to give an account, the beam of judgment, right? For believers. Right. And I'm looking Honestly, it, it sometimes it scares me, but when you walk with the Lord, 
uh, I believe there's a real joy knowing that we lay our crowns down at his feet anyway, but there are rewards in heaven and it motivates me. At least that's what I can tell from God's word. And part of that for me is taking a stand on the truth. Amen. I'm just, to me, that's just so thrilling mm. when believers, regardless of what walk of life they're in, whether they're well-known, whether they're not known, whether they're intermediate known, no matter what they have for a career, when they determine that they're going to follow the Word of God no matter what it costs, follow the Lord Jesus, there's always a price to pay. Some yeah. people pay a really steep price. Some of us don't pay that big of a price, but there's always a price to pay. Yep. And it's exciting to see people take those choices with their eyes on the reward in heaven, and well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Never gets old. Never gets old. So we'll see what happens. It comes out in a couple of weeks, and I'm I'm excited for it. Amen. Amen. I am too. Now, Christians are going to face trials. There's no doubt about it. How should Christians face trials? Well, the Bible says a lot about that, I think. Um, bless, uh, uh, um, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds, right? Amen. Didn't Paul say that? Um, I think Philippians 4 is good. Rejoice always, give thanks continually, rejoice in all circumstances, or give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Yeah, You know, everybody knows that don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the God of peace will, trend, will guard your hearts. And the peace that passes all understanding, but then it gives you the antidote on how to do that. If it's true, noble, trustworthy, righteous, and a couple of the words I can't remember, think about these things, put them into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. There's often those nice, you know, headline verses, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, but the context is pretty much gone. And so... It's. I think it's a way cooler to understand the context. It's a lot more fulfilling, and you get a lot more done in your heart and ultimately in your life when you understand that because of the weights I lifted when I was a kid, I'm a lot stronger now. Because of the time I put in as a practicing guitar player when I was a kid, I can play now, and I can leave without thinking. That is a in, in a form of practice, but a trial I think is many, very similar a trial that the Lord gives us. You know, I always think of that. That's it. God will never give us too much or give, give us what we can't handle. I'm like, it doesn't make any sense. God continually gives us things or there are things that we can't handle. It is only through his strength that we are able to even stand. Yeah. So I look at those, some those, those nice, like people say like, God helps those who helps himself, that kind of thing. I'm like, no, he doesn't. There's nothing in the scripture that says that. Now it says, be diligent. It says, be wise. It says, keep on the straight and narrow. So I always think of those things, you know, and the, and the trials can make us stronger. Amen. And I, I think if you look at it that way, um, you're not scared, you're not anxious about it. And so, you know, consider it pure joy, brothers, when you face trials of many kinds, for it will develop, uh, what is it? Um, perseverance, perseverance. Um, forgive me, Paul's saying it, and eventually it leads righteousness and strength, and eventually overcoming all that stuff. Amen. So, one, one thing I've often thought about trials, can you imagine how discouraging it would be to be the devil when you're trying to get Christians to deny their faith and walk away and break them? And in the short term, it looks like you're having a little bit of success, but in the long term, all you do is strengthen them in their faith. Um, man, it'd be miserable to have a batting average of zero after 5,000 years or that's a great years. analogy. <clears throat> That's a great analogy. I've never thought about it like that. Yep. Satan's batting zero. <laughs> <laughs> Twice I love so baseball. <laughs> <laughs> and I just love the fact that if we look at our trials, like one of my favorite passages is our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal way to glory. Now, if you were just taking the word exceeding, you think, okay, we can wrap our mind around that. I mean, this is like, okay, I can see a big a big line of train, you know, a train with 120 cars full of glory, exceeding glory. I can, I can picture that. But now bringing the word eternal, we're talking infinite, all of a sudden, my, my mind is blown. I love that. Our so light and momentary troubles. 
I love that so, scripture. So our trials, the things that we go through, they are earning infinite interest for every trial we face in the Amen. bank of heaven. I often think too of the real extreme ones, like you know, being murdered or, or being a, um, a <clears throat> martyr. You know, yep. being murdered, being beheaded. There are specific, really high rewards for those people in heaven. Oh, no doubt. You know, and I just think, okay, well, if I'm not that, and I, I don't want to go through that, but if I do, it's interesting that there is a specific type of reward that goes to those kind of people. So imagine if there's a lesser trial, I'm like, thank you, Lord, forgive me, whatever you give me. It is by the grace of God that I have a breath in my lung. So if you give it to me, I will take it and I will use it to your glory. Trials or not. And I think that's one of the things that we have the privilege of doing is turning it back and counting it all joy as the scriptures say it's not hard or it's not easy to do but i've had some good examples in my life of people who do that and so i'm really thankful the lord gave me them amen what's your favorite verse that you turn to over and over again when you're in a hard situation or a hard trial Philippians 1 6, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it to the day of Christ Jesus. There's an old song, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He who started the work will be faithful to complete it in you. Philippians 1 6. I love that verse. My dad mm -hmm. used to sing that to me when we were kids because it, at some point you realize. He starts it, he, in, he helps us endure, and he finishes it. So why am I worrying about trying to come up with the plan? Just read the book. It's all in there, you know? And so it brings me a lot of comfort knowing that. I don't know if you ever heard this little ditty. I heard it when I was a young believer, and the guy had kind of a Scottish accent. I don't know if I can get it down or not, but it goes something like this. Cheer up, ye saints of God, you have nothing to worry about. Nothing to make you feel ashamed, nothing to make you doubt. Remember that Jesus never fails, so why not trust him today? You'll be sorry you worried at all tomorrow morning. <laughs> that sounds like an Irish jig for sure. <laughs> yeah. I love those little songs. I teach my kids. Uh, the, one of the new things I'm doing this year is Bible Bops, B-O-P-Z. They're scripture memory verses for kids. I'll teach you one. One's... um. Uh, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they won't turn from it. Proverbs 22 6. Proverbs 22 6. And then in Romans 8 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8 31. I think I even did that at the Prophecy Watchers Conference. Yeah, you know, God's, you did. God's word is so easy to put to music, it's like endless amount of lyrics, and I've always found that they just come. People always ask me, what's my favorite song? I always say the next one. And it's sometimes it, it amazes me that the there's still inspiration there for the next one because God is not short of inspiration. He is the well that does not run dry. And there's always a new song in our heart when we know the word and fall after Jesus. What's amazing to me is how deeply embedded music can go into your heart. I've had times where I'm in the middle of a trial and I just start singing. All of a sudden, I find myself singing a song I haven't sang for decades. Yeah. And the yep. words come out. Yep. You know, what's interesting, too, is people who suffer with Alzheimer's or dementia. Yep. Same thing. Same mm -hmm. thing. They remember lyrics. They remember melodies. They come alive. Music is supernaturally powerful. And I think the enemy knows that. I mean, if you look at the amount of people who have claimed to have done a deal with the devil in the music industry, many of whom died at the age of 27, Robert Johnson, Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, Janis Joplin, the list goes on and on and on. All of them in some way, shape or form, from my research, had some dealings in the occult. So the enemy knows the power that comes from music. He knows <clears throat> the tantalizing drug that being worshipped can be. You know, when you're a lead singer of a band, it is, I mean, people just... They're singing your song. They're, you know, you're leading. It can get really distorted in your head and your heart if you're not grounded in the word. I know I've had, I've had to deal with this where you feel like you are the reason they are there. Mm. And that small thing starts to turn. And if you don't know the Lord Jesus, I mean, it, you're, you, it will take you down. 
it will just so distort your reality. It will so distort anything in your life. And that drug that you get as a, a you know, a singer songwriter that people worship. I mean, you'll have to keep going more and more and more. It's just like drugs. I mean, fame is a really addictive drug in my opinion. And I think it, you have to be really careful of that. I mean, I don't think pastors are any different. Anybody on a platform, you know, I think it's really, I think it's, it's, people who really do it well i really i really admire because they know where they're pointing to they're always pointing to jesus it's never about them amen and as a preacher too part it's going to be similar to in music the ultimate aim should be pointing to the jesus of the bible and the bible of jesus and i find that my number one message it's underneath almost all of my messages is i want people to to be tighter with the authority and inspiration of scripture to trust the scriptures more. And so a lot of my messages, I'll walk people through a subject and the subject is secondary. The primary goal is teaching people how to study the Bible. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> amen. It's kind of like that thing, you know, do you want to teach somebody to, do you want to give them a fish or teach them how to fish? You know? Amen. Same thing. Um, my dad always held the Bible when he was preaching, right? And I I still do the same thing. I did it the other night when I was leading worship in my girls' youth group because I think it's so important to lift up the Word of God. A lot of people say in the progressive church, you know, my wife deals with a lot of these things. She loves, she's a very good thinker. She's a really great just speaker, communicator with her words. And so many people twist the Word of God to where it fits their narrative. It's their version of Jesus. It's their version. Uh, a lot of them only go to English. And I've learned over the years, like English can be sometimes a very poor translation. You know better than me, but man, they are, this progressive church movement that we have right now in America is, is like, it's occultish in my opinion. I mean, so many Christians love the Enneagram. Yep. I mean, the Enneagram, it was written through auto writing. That's demonic. And yep. so that tends to pervade itself throughout a lot of Christian culture. And if you don't know the word, which is Jesus, according to John 1 and Colossians 1, I believe. Is it Colossians 1 or 3? I can't remember. But he is the word. So yeah. it's like people will say, ah, I just want Jesus. I don't really deal with the Bible. I'm like, I don't think you can separate them. That's they right. are one and the same. Because otherwise you're going to have to throw out a ton of scripture to back up your version of scripture. And That's right. I, I I just think that not only is that foolishness, it's dangerous, but it is very popular right now. Yeah, I like to tell people, you can distinguish the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the Lord Jesus, but you cannot divide them. There's no tension between them. The leading of the Spirit and the leading of Scripture are never contrary. The leading of the Spirit and the will of the Lord Jesus are never contrary. Amen. They're hand in hand, hand in glove. Uh, that's one of the most dangerous precedents in the modern evangelical church is going down that road where yep. they're trying to put tension between those things. And they love that word too. It's, it's, it's slippery language too, like <clears throat> being curious or being, um, you know, just living in the middle ground in the tension. I'm like, really? Like you're just going to stay there, you know, just stay forever in this middle ground. Like there is absolute truth. And you can right. stand on it. And yes, you will lose friends. And yes, you might lose jobs. You know, I, I, somebody, well, it's another story, but there's so much that the modern day church, I've, I've played in a lot of them, over 3,000 I counted. I'm so interested in speaking to people who are typically older, who've been through the trials of life. They love God's word. They're not typically attracted to the flashiness of the modern day evangelical worship movement. I've noticed that pastors who are bivocational, at least for a season, um, and preach the word out and encourage others to do outside of Sunday morning, and they're a smaller as church, those are the ones that are the most mature. Those are the ones we love to visit and to serve with. We've been in some big churches. We were in a big church in, in Kansas City not too long ago, and the pastor said, worship is for us. And it's smiling. It's big, huge, lots of money, big, big, lots, thousands of people. And I get up there and I'm just like, the Bible says 
we worship God and God alone. And I don't know that we'll get asked back to that church, but I had to take a stand because so many people will just go, oh, yes, if the pastor says that, it must be true. You know, well, what if that pastor went to a seminary that's pretty woke and doesn't teach the whole of Scripture? What if that pastor is more interested in selling his next book or building the next building? And I know it sounds harsh, but that's a reality. I mean, when you are a promoter, you have to get butts in the seats. That's You'll right. Do what, You'll do whatever it takes sometimes, because when you have butts and seats, you know, and practically speaking, you can pay the staff, you can keep the lights on. And it's an endless battle. Ministry and money just tends to get messy, you know, and and and, and I still struggle with it, too, Like, because I'm in Christian music. I make money and royalties off of producing other records or making my own music. So I sometimes I don't know how to answer people other than man. I just have to point people to Jesus and go back to the word and understand yeah. it. When it, it it is literal, I take it as literally as I possibly know how to. It tells you when it's symbolical. It tells you when it's um, anything other than literal. And I think that's the way we need to take it. If if I have to default on that, I would go, okay, I believe it. I don't understand it, but I believe it. Which also means that the Holy Spirit is leading me not to promote myself. And a lot of times, Christian artists that I've seen will justify promoting themselves and watering down the message to share the gospel. And I'm like the seeker sensitive thing, you know, eventually it's just cotton candy and you're feeding Great. sugar to, to, to babies and they love cotton candy and they don't know any better, you know? And so I have compassion. So that's why I, and I'm not slamming. I'm just going, that's the reality that I've seen personally. So when I go up on stage, I always make it a very specific point to read scripture and to highlight God's word and to share my testimony when it's applicable to those things, because the word of the Lord never returns voice void. And I, I'm really proud of that, that every, every opportunity we've given, you know, a lot of times I would share the genealogy of Genesis five from Adam to Noah. And I would spells out the plan of salvation. I, I lost some friends over that. I hmm. had a past, I had a pastor come up to me, tell me he was a Protestant pastor. I, I noticed that when I said that Billy Graham doesn't save you, the Apostle Paul doesn't save you, and the Pope doesn't save you, I noticed a couple of people got up and left, and he came up to me afterwards and said, you know, you're dividing the church, saying that the Pope doesn't save us. You know, my Catholic friends, they left. I'm like, well, he doesn't. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but to me. That's Jesus. And this is a Protestant pastor. <clears throat> so he's chastising me. For telling people that Jesus is the only way. And it's interesting to me because the Catholic Church, not the people, the system. Hear me loud and clear. The system, in my opinion, is Luciferian. It's evil. Amen. So Great. people don't want to hear that. And a lot of times they don't know any better, you know. But as a Christian musician or people in ministry, you're having a lot of ex-Catholics coming to churches. Or you're having a lot of people who are just searching. And so I think it's important to just call a spade a spade. And a lot of pastors are not willing to do that because sometimes those people won't come back the next week. And that affects the money in the bottom line. The rea That's the reality. And it's difficult to get around that. I understand as somebody who's been in ministry, I'm like, well, how do you get people to pay for stuff? You know, it's difficult. And I think that's why Jehovah Jireh is one of the names of our God. He is our provider. You know, it's interesting. Lee, correct me if I'm wrong, but the only time God says test me is when it comes to him as a provider. Uh, is it... Um, is it Malachi or Zephaniah chapter three? Test me and see that I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. That's right. You'll, yep. That you'll have so much you won't have enough room for it in your storehouses. You know, the modern day church loves the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, right? But I'm like, well, there are multiple heavens. You know, he's probably preparing lots of stuff. And I I just always think of the people who are humble servants who don't get any fame. And I'm like, I always want to be like them. The guy that greets us at 6 a.m. when we'd get off the bus. And I was so glad that we were there. And I would just say, thank you so much. Here's a cup of coffee. Hey, let's go serve the Lord today. You know, yeah. I like those people. People who are, who are died in the wool followers of Jesus. They don't just say grace, peace, mercy, and love from stage. And God, they say the name of Jesus. And I know that's English, but I think it counts. So I, I got real sensitive to those things. There are some artists that I've seen over the years, like they won't say the name of Jesus because it divides. You know, I've had to, I put it in so many of our songs and I can tell sometimes 
when it makes some of my other co-writers or producers even the label squirm a little bit. Mm. And I just, I've just noticed those things over the years, you know? And so I just did it anyway. Because <laughs> I ultimately, I don't answer to them. <laughs> yeah, I've had a bit of a reputation myself over the years of being a bit of a boat rocker. And uh, even in my own circles, which I've been with for decades, church circles, I'm not a very well-known commodity, but outside of my own circle, um, amongst God-fearing churches of all stripes, dozens of different groups and denominations where people have a hunger for the word, they know we're in the last days, they love the prophetic word, those people uh, really appreciate me. So I guess everybody that's going to devotedly follow the Lord is going to be both evil spoken of and well spoken of, known and unknown, as we read in Corinthians. <clears throat> I like to call them foxhole brothers and sisters. Amen. Yep. There's, I've noticed there's, there's not as many as I'd hoped, but I'm really glad when I find somebody like Amen. you. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this kind of brings us up to where I'd like to close our, our, our um, program with, and then we can go on to some Q&A if you have time. I do. We usually do a little Q&A. Uh, but if you have to go, just give me a heads up and let me hey, know. Hey, is that you, Joy? Joy, Joy! Excuse me one second. I'm on a live interview. I'm so sorry. Oh, why don't you? Are she you can up? come in and say hi. <laughs> we heard a noise. Are you okay? You got an okay? Good. Okay, I'll come check on you a bit. See you, <laughs> so who is that that's michael's uh, niece joy she's coming oh, yeah. in to stay for the weekend so i'm the house sitter michael's on tour with mercy me so joy just came in and she's checking in all right i'm, I'm in the basement so they're way upstairs <laughs> oh yeah yeah so how far away does he live from you in your house uh 20 minutes oh yeah okay we're in franklin he's in brentwood we met on a rock and road rock and worship road show two or years ago and she came friends and he needed somebody to run and build a studio. So that was me. Nice. Nice. Praise the Lord. Now we got talking about the last days and it just seems like that's become huge conversation in the last three, four years, even amongst people that weren't interested in the last days until recently. What are some of the things in this world around us, whether in America or the broader world, that you see things are changing? What are you looking at? Man, AI, the red heifer, the Temple Mount, UFOs and aliens, the fact that the apostate church is really successful, <clears throat> um, the fact that there are Bibles that are, you know, like in China, they're changing the Bibles, you know, deliberately. Probably been doing that a long time. Lots of nations over there centuries but i've noticed too that people are starting to say the words they're saying the word evil instead of just bad or bad politics they're like this doesn't make sense and i'm like it's because it's supernatural it's biblical That's it's right. not just politics or it's good versus evil good old-fashioned good versus evil and it's starting to encroach on our cities and in our front doors to where people can't ignore it anymore. The supernatural is in all the movies. I think the enemy has to tell you what he's going to do before he does it. Uh, one of my questions to you is, does the, the enemy has prophecies we know. The Catholic Church has their own prophecies. Yeah. In fact, they say that this pope is the last pope. So I think the enemy has to copycat and distort the truth, right? That's, but I think yeah. it's... it's I don't think he's hiding it anymore in some ways. And so I think you're seeing a, a real, like... Man, we're, are we on the last couple of laps here of the track where everybody's really starting to speed up around that last corner? Because they know the finish line's coming. So even in the lingo and mainstream media, it, it, some of the people I follow on YouTube and all that kind of stuff, they're starting to say, and these aren't believers, they're starting to say evil. They're starting to say, this doesn't make sense. They're starting to say, hmm, the Bible's been talking about this. And that's the interesting thing, as I think people's eyes are being opened. And I pray in the, in the name of Jesus that they come to a saving knowledge of who Jesus is before it's, before the rapture, obviously, but it, for sure afterwards. And I think we're and maybe it's possible that we'll see a great revival up until then. But it looks like, I don't know, it's hard to tell. I just know that my job is to go occupy and rescue those stumbling towards the fire. And my primary role is as a husband and a father, which is why I left the road. But I'm going to continue to put out music and do whatever I can 
to point people to Jesus. I think it's more obvious than ever. And I think you're starting to see it in not only like Joe Rogan and some of these other greats, like he's skirting around it. He's close, you know, Jordan Peterson. And I'm like, just Lord, bring him into the fold, you know? Amen. Amen. So you I, know, I, I was, I noticed that Joe Rogan was very recently said something along the lines of, we just need Jesus to come down and clean this up. Saw that episode. Yep. Yep. And I remember Tucker Carlson <laughs> said, it's frankly, it's just evil. And I'm like, Finally, somebody said it, you know, because I don't have his platform, but he did. He said it. Yeah. So I think it's becoming more obvious to the point of where people are, they can't hide anymore, nor can they hide it, nor can they run from it. So I think they're having to deal with it. And I'm just praying they come deal with it through God's word. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I just, some of the things you mentioned are some of the very same things that are on my heart too, just this evil and darkness is coming out of the closet. It's getting in our face. It's coming from every angle. And I, myself, when it comes to revival, I don't think we're going to see a nationwide revival like the first and second Great Awakenings. Agreed. But I would love to see, and I believe that we can see, a revival in the remnant where the lukewarm mm. get excited, where backsliders get restored, where Christians who they're already devoted but Maybe there's areas that they're not awakened to and they get awakened to them. I have just observed that when people uh, start thinking about Bible prophecy and they, they get interested in it, the Bible becomes a brand new book. What does it say? His mercy is new every morning. I think that goes for pretty much everything that he created. When you do it in his name and in, in his ordination, right? Totally true, man. You're, I think you're in, it, that's interesting. I think you're right on that because people will say, I think there's going to be a great revival. I'm like, I don't know, man. From what I'm seeing, people are going away from God's word. How can you have a revival to death? Yep. I mean, we are because, you know, the enemy is running a lot around. So, but revival, you have to revive the dead. That means repentance, that means yep. coming to salvation no not just saying jesus my savior but like i repent yeah. right so i die to myself and be resurrected that's a really good point you make about the remnant really good point well you know the the character of the age in general at the end of the ages is, is apostasy and, yes. and so once that going over the edge of the cliff starts to happen there's there's no turning around you know if the mountainside starts to slide down the mountain it's too late to stop too it. too late it's and too late. I think it's the same thing with the world around us. But the Bible also says on the flip side, um, when the enemy comes in like a, the flood, a, the spirit of the Lord raises up a standard, standard against, against him. him. And so right. I think that the Lord is stirring the hearts of the serious believers. I think we're seeing a separation happening. Totally. Yes. And Right and on. Real Christians are 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 gravitating towards circles and fellowship where there's more Bible and wishy-washy Christians are drifting away from that and going to where there's less Bible and more touchy feely. For sure. And what's hard is that a lot of people, you know, I've, I've said that I've mentioned this many times and you start not only to lose friends, but you, you don't get to play in the industry anymore. Mm. Like, well, he's not one of us. And we don't want him to play. And yeah, that's just part of what I've been seeing. And so you have this, you know, can you be part of the corporate thing as, as part of a Christian and still adhere to God's word? I'm noticing more and more the bigger the churches get, the bigger the ministries get. It's like it's so so many business meetings and committees. And there's it's just you lose like, why are we doing this again? And you have the lukewarm church. My dad would always remind me that the model. Oops, we lost somebody. Is, we lost some You're back. Oh, sorry. That was my wife. My, uh, you know, when Israel became a nation in 48, do you agree that that's the last generation that's initiated? I do. I myself do believe in the fig tree generation. Yep, it's absolutely. not real popular in some academic circles, but um, I'm childlike faith in the scriptures first and academic second. So I like that childlike faith, unless you become like a little child. Right. Well, you know, I, the I just I don't know how this lesson came to me as a young believer, but as a young Christian, 
just saved a few years, I observed that a lot of my friends went one of two directions. They were either going off in the Bible school direction and becoming intellectuals and academics, and then they would lose some of that childlike faith, they'd lose that zeal, they'd lose the fire. And then other Christians were going in a direction where they're all about faith and zeal, um, but they didn't really want any kind of academic rigor in, in their life. And I thought, you know what? There should be zero contradiction between the highest scholarship and childlike faith. And that's what I've tried to have. So what's, and you have, in my opinion, what's that verse? They have zeal without knowledge. That's in Romans. Romans. So Paul obviously saying zeal without knowledge. I see that all the time. You know where I first saw that, that I noticed it was in college with all the social justice stuff. Oh, yeah. It's like, this is this is good, but it doesn't seem like the Holy Spirit was like ding 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 ding. It doesn't seem like it's straight scriptural too either. You know, and eventually I think it weeds its way into the modern day church where you're quoting philosophers more than you're quoting God's word. Yep. Well, and if we the church, church has like the vision that. to stay contemporary and up to date, they're going to have their hand on the pulse of the world rather than the pulse of of Christ in the scriptures. That is a dangerous precedent. Yes. And I, a lot of times I don't, it's amazing to me, I don't think they know that. Yeah. I, don't think they, I don't think they see it. And if you try to highlight it to them, they'll just say you're, you know, a Bible bumper or whatever. And, you know, it, it's amazing to me. You know what I just pray for? I pray, Lord, bring me people that want to know. Amen. You do Amen. <laughs> So, I'll continue to do what I'm doing, but you do it. So you'd mentioned uh, that you're in a church now, uh, a fellowship of believers. Uh, tell us a little bit about this, if you don't mind. Well, we started a home church about eight years ago. Okay. We, we couldn't find a church that really just taught the Word. I mean, there's, there's churches that teach the Word, but a lot of them don't teach the whole Word. They'll stay in the New Testament. You know, it, it, to me, I always think people have a hard time with Genesis 6. They have a hard time with UFOs and aliens. They have a hard time with uh, giants. They have a hard time in the New Testament with Revelation. They, they just So they stay in the Gospels, and they're like, well, the Lord fulfilled it. Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament, so we don't have to worry about it anymore. I'm like, that couldn't be farther from the truth. That's right. I, I always love what Chuck Mister taught me. He said, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. I think Amen. it's not only important, but imperative for us to know the whole of Scripture. I think it's important for us to know why these books are in the canon and these other apocryphal books aren't, even though they're good history books. Yeah. The Book of Enoch, Jasher, um, Book of Wars, you know, <clears throat> all that kind of stuff. And I, I think it's more fascinating, too. The kids these days are getting it at all the movies, and churches don't ad address it at all. Yeah. They're sending them off to college to get their brain full of mush, and then they don't know why they leave the church. They're like, why did you guys leave the church? Well, I mean, honestly, it's kind of obvious. They don't have any foundation. That's they right. Just went, they just went to church. I think know? that's one of the reasons, too, why people for, walk away from the pre-trib rapture. They grow up in Bible-believing churches that are doctrinally sound on paper, but they get mediocre ministry, and they don't get a solid foundation in the gospel. They hear it preached. They just don't get a theological doctrinal understanding of it that goes deep in the scriptures. They hear prophecy talked about, but they don't get a solid foundation from the Bible in a theological perspective. Uh, the first time they hear something that, uh, that challenges it severely, they just embrace it and walk away. Yeah, it's what is the parable, you know, the weeds? Yep. You know, that it seems to be applicable there when Jesus was saying, I, I think it's it's amazing to me how much information we have and yet people don't want it. We can look up anything on God's word and find a, a biblical answer from a variety of sources. And people would rather have that feel good thing, whether it be a worship song or the next book or, you know, they get addicted to. I don't know. You know, I, I've just noticed too, like a lot of pastors that I've noticed, people in ministry, they're so concerned with growing the ministry that they neglect their families. Mm. Just, just basic stuff. 
You know, my parents never did that, and so I was aware of that. But I think my, I think my, I know my dad. He's been a pastor for forty-five years. I know he struggled with always, you know, like Lord, do you want me at a small town, small church? And over the years, he eventually said, absolutely, because that's how we were able to raise a good, solid family. Amen. And that is our first line of of home defense is is the family. You know, in fact, the video that we put out is. I put out this the <clears throat> music video that my brother and I and our our million kids filmed the other day for this music video. We said we deliberately are making this to highlight and promote the most one of the most powerful um, and and spiritually attacked institution in history. It's called the family. Ever since day one, the enemy knew that if he could bring down the father, if he could separate mom and dad. He could get to the kids, and you see that all the time. And I think people do that in the name of ministry, or in the name of even serving the Lord. I've just seen where like pastors are so interested in growing the church, where their kids just are left by the wayside. So, to, I'm so thankful my parents didn't do that. And I, I've seen really awesome ministers too. So, I think that's our first thing is is make disciples. You know, we always think going to all nations, but what about the ones right in our household? That's right. You know, and your neighbors, your yeah. family, extended family. You have influence the there. Store. Yep. My, uh, you know, I, I, we, we pray for my wife's extended family. They, they don't, <clears throat> they go to church, you know, they'd call themselves maybe lapsed Catholic, maybe, but they don't know the Lord Jesus. And we pray for them all the time. But I think it's interesting how I teach our kids, especially our four year old, pray for Grandpa Dick. Because he might listen to you and he might not listen to me. That's right. You know, she's four. Children have a really powerful, it's like music. There's a, there's a way that they get into people's hearts. And so we just train them up to pray for anybody in our family that doesn't know the Lord Jesus. And, you know, and I love them all. And if you're watching, no, I love you. But I believe that Jesus is the only way. Amen. Not the Pope, not the Billy Graham, not whatever viewpoint you have. It's not going to get fixed with politics, and I don't think our, we have much time left, in my frank opinion. I just don't. So I think the day of being real nice and not too, you know, the word, the, a lot of the Greg of churches say, well, you don't want to judge. I'm like, bull honkies. The Bible says you have to judge. That's right. Every day you judge whether this is good for you or not. Like, I'm not going to, you know, we don't, we want our kids to be around the truth. So we judge, therefore, their time and who's influencing them. It's like, duh. You know, so, but in the, for the sake of being so like Jesus, and a lot of the modern day Jesus is this wimpy guy that I'm like, I don't want to follow that guy. You know, like. The Jesus of your average believer is little more than Buddha, you know. You don't really have to serve him. Just rub his belly once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. I'm totally stealing that. Or Santa Claus. Yeah, that's right. You know, same thing. And But the thing is, it makes, that version makes a lot of money. It, it does. You know, about, what, you talked but, earlier about the fact that we're going to give account for our ministry. Doesn't matter if we're a big name ministry or whether we're just ministering with our own kids and the neighbors. Uh, we're going to give account for that. We, we're going to answer to Jesus and we don't answer to those around us. I'd like you to take that theme up because it kind of picks up where you were just talking anyway. Well, the Bema seat, right, is for believers only, correct? When we die. Yep. To give an account for what we've done. The great white throne judgment happens at the end of the millennium, right? For everybody, including yep. myself and you, right? Um, there are other judgments there <clears throat> in Revelation, but it motivates me. I think it would scare. It, it, if you don't know the word, I think it can tend to scare you. But knowing that there are rewards in heaven, knowing that we have to give an account for that, it actually motivates me and forces me to focus my time, my talent, and my treasure. Amen. And, and the older I get, the more I realize, like, thank you, Lord, for even giving that to me. You know, He gave me the faith to trust Him in, in the first place, according to Ephesians two. So, is it Ephesians two? Romans 8, he Roman predestined. Yeah, yeah, he predestined us, right? Yeah. So even the faith that we have is from the Lord. 
So I'm like, I when I realized that, I'm like, there is no reason I should contend with the scriptures other than to believe it. Every word from cover to cover, as literally as I know how, and to study it in that regard. And I have found so much joy and freedom in no in trying to study God's word literally. Mm. Reading it like a history book. I debated with one of my college professors one day. I said, I think the, the Bible is the best science book there ever was in history book. He's like, ah, it's not a science book. It's a Christian school. You can't read it like a science book. I'm like, I beg to differ. Numerology, dimensions, um, a whole bunch of stuff that I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, physics, <clears throat> you know, I, the he multiple heavens, you know. I, I always go back to like the fact that like the enemy uses the word against us. Why would we not study it for ourselves? Yeah. He knows it better than we do. Why are we wasting our time on the Enneagram? Yeah. You know, the, the Bible, you're talking about science in the Bible, and it's a very interesting one. The Bible says that the earth is on pillars. And yes. sometimes people think like four pillars under it. Yeah. But it the pillars are the North Pole and the South Pole. And the ancients knew that. When the electromagnetic fields of the earth were stronger, you not only saw the northern lights that, that kind of spread out like tents, and the southern lights that did the same thing, but just like on the wine, the, when you see the diagram for an electrical motor and you see the electromagnetic field, you would see the vertical pillar at the north and the vertical pillar at the south. And uh, the ancient testimonies from ancient history, people were witnesses of that, which is why the northern peoples still dance around the Maypole, which is a celebration of that figure that they used to see. And so the Bible tells us about the pillars of the earth. Sure does. You know, what's interesting, too, is Tolkien puts the two trees at north and south, the pillars. Oh, yeah. In the Silmarillion, I'm a love Tolkien. It's interesting how it pervades in every culture. You know, in every ancient culture, you got a story of the giants, you got UFOs, yep. you got a flood, you got a boat and a guy, you got a dragon, you got all these things. You, the, why are the pyramids lined up with the stars? You know. Oh, I heard an interesting thing. What do you think about this? Is the is the this new Jerusalem a cube or a pyramid? Personally, I think because it's called a city. I think it's going to have a skyline just like a glorious city, except that it'll be a thousand, maybe a hundred thousand times more magnificent than anything man has ever built. Cool with me. Do you think we'll be able to fly dimensionally? Absolutely. See, I, I suspect that what we're going to see in eternity is that we will be just like the Lord Jesus. We'll be able to walk through a wall, sit in a chair, so we will be able to interact with physical creation. We will not be limited by physical creation. But this, you can expand this principle. And so we'll be able to walk barefoot along the, uh, the beach or ride a horse, ride a motorcycle, ride a Star Wars light cycle, or just instantaneously travel from point A to point B, even if they're 5 million light years away. I often think people, you know, they, they they forget there's a new heaven and a new earth, this earth. Yeah. Right. I, I'm like, I, I for people, I, I think, forget that, you know, we're, a lot of times they think we're going to be naked babies floating on clouds. I'm like, yep, man, I, 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 I have a message I preach once in a while that's called three square feet. And I deal with this concept where people have this idea that heaven's just 24-7 formal worship around the throne. And we'll be like ghosts, kind of there, kind of not there. You know, we might be given a heart, maybe not. Um, that's, that's just so not true. Why would we have this insanely massive city if we were going to be packed like sardines around the throne and that's all we ever did? Great point. And then why would there even be a new heavens and a new earth if we're not ever going to even turn around and look at the stars? Yeah. No, personally, I believe that as, as the heirs of God and the co-heirs of Christ Jesus, and Christ is the heir of all things, then we read in, in uh, Revelation chapter, uh, I can't never remember if it's 21 or 20, I think it's chapter 20, that we are going to inherit all things. It's either 27 or 21-7. But we're going to inherit all things. 
And the things are in the previous six verses, and, and the new heavens and the new earth are part of that. I think that that God is going to take the creation mandate to, to subdue the earth, and he is going to expand it to the entire creation. And so Great point. When we stand before the Lord at the uh, for our rewards, and, and it says, "Whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, in that day shall be given you," I fully intend to ask for ten galaxy clusters, not ten galaxies, ten galaxy clusters. But to me, what's interesting about this is this would be like asking Bill Gates for a quarter to put it in a bubble gum machine. <laughs> I think I found it, by the way. Is it 21-7? All yep. who are victorious will inherit all these blessings. Yes. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. That one? It is 21-7 then, yep. Yep, 21-7. So what a blessing it is. We are going to inherit everything there is. I love to think about eternity because we're going to have infinite time in an infinite utopia with infinite energy infinite resources, and infinite opportunity. It will be impossible not to be a fulfilled human being in eternity. Impossible. And I think uh, I would add to that access face-to-face -face with an infinite God. Oh, absolutely. And, right. and, and that's really what's going to, the glue that brings everything together and holds it together. Amen. Because if we were given this infinite universe with all of its blessings and God was not in it, it would, no matter how much fun we had at the start, it would slowly become empty. Absolutely. We realize this. The longer we walk with the Lord, the more we realize that no matter how much we enjoy the believers, no matter how much we enjoy music, no matter how much we enjoy the gifts of God, which were given to us richly to enjoy, mm. if these things are not in orbit around God, they become empty. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, in that new heaven and a new earth, and even in the millennium, it says that we're going to judge the angels, right? Yes. Is that particularly pertaining to the millennium? Because afterwards, obviously, they're judged and they're no longer around. But I've always thought it was interesting. It says we will judge the angels. What do you think that really means practically? Well, I think there's going to be two levels of that. The first level is that when the, the um, ungodly angels are given their eternal sentencing, that we will be part of the court. Uh, and there's going to be a good reason for this. The angels were wired in such a way that it was easier to stay right than it was to fall. Two-thirds of them stayed right, and only one-third fell. They had to go out of their way to fall. Mm. And they, they were in the presence of the eternal, infinite God. Wow. Now, Human beings were wired in such a way that it was impossible not to fall. The, the first time that we were given opportunity to fall, mankind fell. Mm. And, and the only way that we can be restored is by an amazing work of grace. So we, were, we fell in an ideal environment with one temptation, and then we are restored in a chaotic battlefield um, with one opportunity to be right, which is Jesus. And so Amen. these people, because they found victory through the Lord in such an awful circumstances, and the angels fell in such good circumstances, we are going to be their judges. Um, the, wow. the second way I think that, the, that we'll be over the angels is that the angels are going to ultimately be the servants of redeem mankind. Redeem mankind is the highest of all of God's created beings. It says in James, we're the first fruits of all of his creation. Interesting. I've never thought of it in that kind. The highest of all created beings are redeemed yep. Christians. Because right now the angels are higher than us, but right. in the resurrection, we will be above them. And that's... So in Jewish uh, tradition, they figured that it, this was part of the cause for the angels to fall and get angry because they figured out that puny man was going to be above them in the resurrection. That was God's ultimate plan. So they're mad. Yeah. Uh, what about the Jews? Where do they fall in line with that? 
Um, which Jews? The ungodly well, Jews or the saved Jews? I guess both, because okay. God God's chosen people has an aspect there too, yeah. but obviously well, Messianic Jews are well, would be a part of the redeemed Christians, right? Yep. Yeah. Well, ultimately what we're gonna have is everyone ultimately that's redeemed is gonna be redeemed by the work of Christ. They're gonna belong to Christ. And they're all going to be inhabitants, uh, eternal inhabitants of the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is going to come to earth. For all practical purposes, heaven is moving to earth. And then we'll be dwelling for all of eternity in the physical presence of the Father, in the physical presence of the Son, and with the eternal indwelling of the Holy Spirit in, a, in us, so we'll always have the entire Trinity. Now, the Jews, um, they have their own unique relationship with God. Uh, the older dispensationalists, and I think they were right, they call the church the bride of Christ and Israel the bride of Jehovah. Yes. And and uh, ultimately, all the redeemed are going to be brought together. It's very fascinating that when we look at uh, the New Jerusalem, between the 12 gates and the 12 foundations, you have the 12 patriarchs of Israel represented and the 12 apostles of the church. I wonder if there'd be a third set of 12 just to complete three, or maybe there's seven. Would there be a third in your eyes? Well, I'm not exactly sure uh, how else there's they're going to be there. I mean, I don't think there's going to be more than 12 foundation stones and, and more than 12 gates. Would but somehow, be- somehow, some way, all the redeemed of all the ages are going to have their place in the city. Would those two sets of 12 somehow relate to the 24 elders? I don't think so, um, because I think that the 12 apostles and the 12 patriarchs are different than the 24 uh, uh, well, the, the 24 elders. The mm. 24 elders, I think, are the heads of the 24 courses of the priesthood, the, the Royal New Testament priesthood. And... I, I suspect, I wouldn't be surprised if it's a rotating office, um, that maybe there'll be hundreds of people that rotate through each of the 24 courses over any great length of time. What but, is the course again? Well, the, in the Old Testament, in the temple, we see in first, I think, I can't remember, it's first or second Chronicles 24, David appointed uh, 24 courses of priests, and they rotated in the temple service. Well, the, the, everything about the temple was patterned after the true temple in heaven. So there were 24 courses down here because there's 24 courses in, in heaven. And uh, so in eternity, all the believers will be divided up into 24 courses of believers. But this implies is every one of us is going to spend, our course is going to spend two weeks, just our course in formal worship around the throne. It's patterned after the Old Testament, so it's going to work the same way. Or similar, and then four times a year, all of the believers are going to be gathered. So I'm just going by Old Testament analogy, and I think this is a legitimate analogy because the Old Testament is based on the the heavenly pattern. So what a blessing this is going to be! Everybody is going to be all the believers in the church will be in one of those 24 courses. That's going to be a fun day. Oh man, to me, just the thought that rapture trumpet is going to blow. Mm. And every believer is going to be gathered in the clouds, and we're going to be chest bumping, high fiving, shouting, and dancing. It's going to be like a Pentecostal church gone crazy. <laughs> the true one, the true Pentecostal. Amen. I love that. Yep. Okay, Lee. So obviously, we don't want to set dates, but it does seem to me, and I've had this conversation many times with people, they're like, ah, we can't have it. We can't know. Well, I'm like, well, first of all, we're commanded to know the season, right? Yep. And we are given a lot of signs, not only for that season, but probably more specifically that. Does it seem to you that as the day approaches, the day, the rapture, that is, does it seem like the focus, like a glass, you know, eyeglasses, where you're focusing to where you're seeing more clearly and clearly as the day approaches? Is that something that you would adhere to? Oh, absolutely. Because prophetic convergence is accelerating. Uh, We have... The convergence is increasing in its variety, it's increasing in its intensity, it's increasing in its frequency. It's basically increasing in every way that iniquity can increase. 
And it's getting bad enough so that you have secular people, as you mentioned earlier, Joe Rogan and and uh, Bro Peterson. You've got yep. people like this who are they're being shook to their very cores. Their their understanding of the world and the universe is being shaken and tried, and and they're realizing that they're it looks like they got to choose between God and the devil, and there's only two choices. That's right. Yep. One or the other, good old fashioned good versus evil. You know, there's no third party. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And yes. that's what the tribulation is all about. The tribulation is designed in such a way so that by the time you get to the end of the tribulation, the entire world is separated. There's going to be two, two parties. There's going to be the party of truth, which is led by the most magnificent demonstration yes. of supernatural power and Bible prophecy ever in the history of the world you're going to have moses and elijah the two that's, witnesses that's what i was going to guess two witnesses you're going to yeah. have 144,000 witnesses who yep. have a special calling yep. every bible believing jew on the planet is going yep. to receive the same pentecostal outpouring that church received at the beginning wow. and then that may well spread to the gentiles if that's a powerful testimony for the truth you're going to have the false messiah with his false prophet, their false miracles, and everyone's going to be polarized. They're going to choose one or the other. So we get to the end of the 70th week, everyone either has the seal of the Holy Spirit or they're going to have the mark of the beast. There'll be nobody without one or the other. That's it. Do you think, going back to that chosen people with the Jews, is there a special reward for those Jews? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean— we have special privileges being part of the body of Christ, the, the bride of Christ in the church. But Israel, they're not going to feel shorted. They're going to have all of their land and temple and throne promises fulfilled in the millennium. They're going to be the bride of Jehovah. They're going to be the glorious city and the glorious country. This will be the capital, not only of earth, but the capital of the entire universe. Oh man, I love that. And we'll be able to traverse the universe. Oh man. I don't know I why we would need to get together with my buddies and build a starship enterprise. Totally. You know what I want to do is play baseball. Oh man. <laughs> yep. I, I intend play to play football in, in eternity. <laughs> I, I want can you imagine what it's going to be like when you can do masculine sports? Um, I, I like to play hockey and football. I never got to play organized hockey, but I love the game. Uh, but what's interesting is you can go out and you can slam and bang and hammer and nobody is going to get injured. Nope. There is no death. That means death of cells, yep. which would include bruising and broken bones and blood clots, whatever. So if there's no death, then if you go backwards from that, then you can't even get a bruise on a hockey rink. Yep. Yeah. I think that would be the case, right? Well, certainly there's not going to be any injuries or pain. Now, there there is kind of a subjective question here. Like it says there's no more tears. And is so is this absolutely no more tears or is this no more tears of sorrow, but still we'd have tears of joy? I can't, you know, we're going to still have tear ducts. Here's another interesting thing. I don't see thought. why not. Yeah. Um I think what what when it talks about no more pain, this is a little bit of a relative subject. Uh, because I think God is going to be working with each of us as individuals. Now, personally, um, I want to feel a little pain when I play hockey and football. I don't want to, you know, come off on a stretcher. But if I have to limp off the field with the Charlie horse that takes an hour to heal, that to me is not a big deal. That'd be all right. But um, just I think this is just the way that minds work. And I wouldn't regard that as pain. I would regard that as fun. <laughs> I mean, yeah, totally. I, I'm with you on that. Yep. I think of, I think about. Here's another question, another subject. To me, the rapture is one of the best evangelical tools we have, and maybe the best in some categories. Think about it. As the day approaches and people recognize that there is evil, yes, that they can't and don't know how to deal with, they That's are right. looking for a savior, right? That's right. To me. If somebody is willing to listen and, and read God's word and believe what it says, I don't think you can get around a pre-tribulational rapture. 
And that's right. I, to me, it's like, well, it's the greatest recruiting tool there is. You know, I often remember think I, I played at a million youth retreats growing up, and there was always, you know, the night where people would give their lives and rededicate to the Lord. Now, that's a lot of good stuff there, believe me, yes. But the pastor would never really do much. It was always about my sin and what I've done. It, w- it rarely was highlighting some of the exciting things about Scripture that these kids who are in those seats are seeing in the movies. There's never any talk about ancient cultures or Genesis 6 or UFOs or aliens. They're all talking about it. But nobody talks about it in regard to that moment where you're rededicating your life or giving your life over to the Lord. And I remember thinking, like, is that all there is? So I get saved from my sin? Then what else? Like, what? But that's why I think it's important that Jesus says, I came to undo all of the works of the evil one. Amen. So it begs the question. What are all of the works of the evil one? To me, that is a really exciting study. And I think it's a great evangelical tool. And I think the rapture (laughs) is at the pinnacle on this side of the millennium, obviously, because I think that is going to rescue people from fear to go, okay, either this is true or it ain't. Either Jesus is a liar or he's everything he says he is. And either I got to get on board or I'm going to be, you know, obviously left behind. I think that's a great tool. He's defiled everything, too. I mean, he's defiled the food we eat. He's defiled medicine. He's defiled education. He's defiled the home and the family. He's defiled music. He's defiled literature. He's defiled movies. I mean, one thing I think about, can you imagine what it's going to be like when we go into the kingdom and we are breathing fresh spiritual air on planet Earth for the first time in 6,000 years? That's a good point. Our bodies will probably grow. (laughs) Oh man! <laughs> but I, I remember having a debate with a friend of mine, an artist, in the back of a tour bus. He says, "Man, there's no point in studying the rapture. It it doesn't have anything to do with spreading the good news of Jesus." I'm like, first of all, doesn't it say that all Scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, right. and training in righteousness? <clears throat> it's God breathed, all of it. So that would have to include First Thessalonians four. And Noah's Ark, the type of the rapture, and a whole bunch of others. And I think, to me, the rapture, though it it wasn't the thing that led me to salvation, it's the thing that gets me excited to go tell people, hey, there's a way out of this. And if you would be willing to trust that it is true, we are going to be evacuated from this. Because in case you haven't noticed, like I don't see that there's any world power, world leader, that can get us out. In fact, the Bible talks about that world power as being the Antichrist. So you don't want to be there with that guy. What's Come interesting out with us, you know? What's interesting about this concept that a lot of people have that we just want to focus on the gospel and basic discipleship, don't want to worry about prophecy. What they don't understand is they're actually undermining the gospel because the gospel, part of that gospel message is there's a choice between salvation or judgment. Judgment is coming upon this world. And so you can't separate the gospel and prophecy. Oh, you're you're silent, brother. Still silent. Don't know what happened.
Still don't have any sound, bro. No sound. Well, maybe what we can do, let's close the regular program right now. If you want to log out, log back in, and then we have a little time for Q&A and wind her up. <clears throat> Hopefully this is going to work, bring him back on. It's interesting once in a while we get trouble with this audio uh, programs that some people are trying to use, and sometimes it's a laptop is not uh, syncing right, and sometimes it's a problem with their microphone. So we'll see what happens here. Lee, sing us a song. All right, I can do that. How about this one here? Take me home. Rapture Road to the place I belong, New Jerusalem, heavenly city. Take me home, Rapture Road. Sometimes I get the feeling that I should have been home yesterday. Yesterday. Anyway, that's just my little take on John Denver. I was thinking that uh, we were going to see, oh, Ben Calhoun says he is going to be back in a second. His phone was dying. That was the problem. His phone died, and that's why we didn't hear him. So he's going to come back, and then we're going to do a little Q&A and wrap this program up. Well, you know, one thing I found interesting once Ben and I got talking about the, the things of God and not talking about him, boy, he just turned from being just like a, a little bit um, subdued to being excited. So I was really excited about that. All right. Am I back? You are back. I plugged in my phone. Sorry about that, guys. All right. No worries. I was just telling the folks that when we were talking about you, you were a little bit subdued. Uh, but once we got talking about the things of the Lord, man, you come unglued. You were just so excited. <laughs> oh man, you well, I don't. I, I think it's hard not to be. It's like yeah. you know, you're rooting for your favorite team and they're winning. You know, yeah. it's like how are you not going to be excited about that? You know. Amen. So I'm going to ask my moderators to send us the Q&A questions, and we will just answer a few. And if you have to go, in fact, they're here already. But if you I'm, have to I'm good. Let's do okay. it. I really love this stuff. This is really fun for me. And then what, when we wrap up tonight, too, I'd like you to hang on for a couple minutes, and we'll have a, I'd like to visit for a couple minutes before you go. Sure. All right, so here's some questions. And I'll let you answer them unless you – have one that you do not want to answer or you don't know the answer. Okay. How can we know that the seals are part of God's wrath and not just man's wrath or Satan's wrath? Well, you're asking me, right? Yeah, you go ahead and answer, and if so, you want to pass it, pass it, I'll take it. Yeah, so what is that, Revelation starting in 14, was it? Well, the Somewhere seals there? start in Revelation chapter 6. 6, okay. Yep. Um we were in 14 last week at church. That's why I was thinking of that. But, I mean, they're they are administered by angels. That's right. Right? So I don't think we can do that as humans. Uh, the, the plagues in the Old Testament, which I believe they're patterned after, they're a type, they were administered by God through the angels. That's right. He didn't, he didn't use Moses other than to talk to Pharaoh. The angels, the angel of death, you know, the angel of the Lord came. I don't think it's a human thing. I think it has to be God supernaturally through his, you know, celestial beings, the angels. Would you Absolutely. agree? Yeah. And the other thing I think about is the, the, the first seals, the rise and reign of the Antichrist. God, that's a judgment upon the world. The world rejected the true Messiah who shed his blood for man's sin. So God gives him a false Messiah who's going to shed their blood for his own iniquitous purposes. 
The fourth seal takes one quarter of the world's population. Yep. That's 20 times the death toll of World War II if you include the death of the soldiers and death by disease and death by famine. A quarter of the world. Wow. Yep. Two billion. If there's eight billion people, you take a quarter of it, that's two billion people. I just, it makes me wonder how many people will go up in the rapture, too, out of that eight billion. All right. Here's a question definitely for you. They want to know about your devotional stuff. So what do you do for, like, Bible reading, Bible study, and do you memorize scripture? Absolutely. I love to memorize scripture. Again, I'm going to be doing a thing called Bible Bops. It's for, primarily for children, but it's super <clears> fun, <throat> upbeat movie or music to help us memorize God's word. You know, if God is for us, who can be against us? Romans 8.31. My devotions are always the not always most of the time these days I'm I'm doing a lot of study reading right now I'm doing that counter moves by L. R. Marzulli he gave to me. Um, I just what, what, did, what did what did L. L. A. Marzulli give you? Counter moves his book. Oh okay yeah yeah so I'm just I'm finishing that one. It's a quick read too. Um, YouTube that has been my favorite way of doing it. I have engulfed myself in some really great teachers over the years but i like to read so my wife and I, the other good discipleship and, and devotion we do is every night at dinner that's what we talk about i purposely ask the girls what they learned in god's word today mm -hmm. my wife always has something to say mm -hmm. and which is great because i think that's a great example for our kids so whatever we're learning or reading that day we always talk about it at night so and i think it's simple too for people who you know like Man, some of us just, it's hard for us to memorize the word. I've always had an easy time with it. I love that, but I, that's just me, though. I just think if you're in the word at all, even if it's a verse a day, man, that do it. Amen. It's awesome. Amen. It will never I tell, return void. I, that's been my advice, too. Even, if, even on the busiest schedules, try and squeeze in at least a few minutes. If you can't do anything else, read one or two verses and just think about them during the yeah, day. Meditate on it. Yep. You know, commit to a verse a week, you know, like do something. But I have truly been blessed. I did, uh, gosh, four or five videos today from Prophecy Watchers, um, a bunch from Chuck Missler. Um. You know, so a lot of times YouTube has been, I, I'm not a podcast guy, but I love to go to YouTube and I love to read. So uh, my favorite book, though, is Genesis. I, I love Genesis. It's a really great book. I love studying that stuff. It set me free from spiritual warfare, demonic attacks, and, and our, understanding that aliens weren't from other planets. I truly believe they are demons. And when I understood that that's spiritual warfare and it started in Genesis 6, which I was always fascinated with, yep. it's like a light bulb went off. And so for me... I love to study Genesis. We have our North Dakota discipleship camp every year early in August. It's one week long. This year, we are doing the first 12 chapters of Genesis. I'm really excited about it. And I'll be doing the two overview uh, outline messages for the camp. But, uh, it's, a, it's a fun camp. We get uh, It's for teens, 14 and up, and then 20s. And a oh, lot of times cool. families come. Whole families come, bring their kids. It's It's been a great time. I love that. Man, getting together with other believers doesn't get old, <clears throat> especially Foxville brothers and sisters. Yep. But one thing I liked about this camp is that there's a very high ratio of adults, instructors, to the kids. You know, a lot of camps, it's like 20 kids per counselor or an adult. We have, like, uh, it's we've had summers where it's been about 50 50 half adults who are instructors or working in the kitchen or parents that want to be there because they that's just the way the family works and and then the kids and it's been great because it's not only camp for the for the campers but it's camp for us old guys that sit around and talk shop <laughs> it's like being a kid in a candy store man Yep. I love it. That's what I like. Like the first night we met, I think I asked you about 4,000 questions. Yep. And I'm like, you just rattled them off. Speak, speaking of questions, somebody made a comment, actually. Mr. Vax 2, I want a t-shirt that says, ask me about the rapture. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. I love that. So All right, what here, else you got? Here's a question. Have you heard of a band called Apologetics? Yeah, we played with them years ago. Yep. 
We opened for him in Mactoon, Illinois, on a runway of a little airport. Oh, wow. Yep. I think we played with him a couple times, actually. Back in the day, man, there was so much more variety in Christian music back in the day. It was so fun. So much fun. Okay, does in Revelation 6, 9 through 10, I believe that's talking about the souls under the altar. So I'm going to bring that up and read it. These people get some serious theological questions in this room. Well, I'm glad you're here. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true? until you judge and avenge our blood on those that dwell on the earth. So the question is, how can God's wrath have already started if they're praying for vengeance? So you're talking about pre-trib wrath? Yeah, yeah. So, so they're wondering, yeah, these people are wondering if maybe the rapture is later on right. after this point. I, I think the, the easiest thing I go to Obviously, the doctrine of imminency, but I just, if you notice, the red letters stop at chapter th at chapter four. There is no more mention of the church. That's right. So I always go back to that one. I think that's deliberate, and I think Jesus did that for a reason, to, and to signify the fact that that's the rapture. We aren't here for the wrath that comes down when he pours out the bowls. Yep, that's the story I always go to. Would you agree? And, yep, that and that and I would. There's also an argument we can come at it from the back end too, and not just the front end. The back end is the fact that um, even though God's wrath has started on the world, um, the those that are responsible for the persecution of the believers, the ungodly human beings, and the ungodly fallen angels. That is not going to be addressed until the second coming, when all the ungodly are slain and cast into hell, and all the ungodly angels are cast into hell. And they and then they're released again at the end of the millennium, too? Yep, that's right. Yeah. Here's a question. What about the sacrifices during the millennium? Are, well, are these literal or are these figurative? That's a you. Um. I doubt it's what people think it is in the temple because the Jews have no reason to sacrifice because they at that point have believed on the on, on Jesus, right? Yeah. Well, here if if this was the Mosaic law in the millennium, th then that would be true. There's 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 no purpose going back to the Mosaic law, right? So the what we're forced to get to because the Mosaic law is put aside. And 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 the whole mosaic structure is put aside, and we move into the Melchizedekian priesthood. Then what we have with the temple in Ezekiel chapters forty through forty-eight with the sacrifices, this must be a memorial. That's all it can be. So it'll be a bloody memorial, but because we're in an earthly, um, it's an earthly dispensation or an earthly economy, then we're going back to earthly things. So. The last dispensation was the earthly economy um, with the old covenant. This dispensation is a heavenly economy or a pilgrim economy with the new covenant. But when we go into the millennium, it's earthly economy with the new covenant. And so there will, so the memorials will the. Well, the sacrifices will be memorials, and they'll be on the exact same level that we have right now with the bread and the wine in the Lord's table. That's that's all it will be. A memorial. Interesting. Yep. yep. Makes sense to me. Yep. Oh, here's an interesting question. Will prayer be different in heaven as opposed to prayer down here on earth? I think it begs the question, what is prayer and how does it function? Yeah, yeah. But being in the presence of Jesus, I, I don't see how it couldn't change, but I don't think it'll go away for for one, because we still aren't face-to-face -face with God the Father yet, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Well, uh, maybe we are, because we're in our resurrected bodies. That's like right. We yep. are. So we can stand before God, right? Yep. But, but trip, uh, millennial believers won't be able to. 
Yep, they'll only see Jesus. Okay, so obviously then prayer. I, I, I get, what would you define prayer as? Because I think that'll help. Well, prayer has got a couple elements. Right at the heart of it is asking and receiving. But you can't separate it from worship and praise either. And so when we get into the eternal state, we got our resurrection bodies, the spiritual war is done. We won't need to pray for victory over sin. We won't need to be able, we won't be praying for strength. We won't have to pray for uh, help from oppressors and persecutors. The whole that whole aspect of prayer is gone forever. But we will still be able to pray in the sense of, uh, Lord, can I have that galaxy? Uh, Lord, I, I want to do something with music. Lord, I want to do this. I want to do that. Um, it's like going to a father asking for ice cream money. That's really what we need to think about it like. And that's God the Father, right? Yeah. Going to us as redeemed in our new body believers going directly to to God the Father, or would we have to go through Jesus still? No, we will be asking the Father directly, but in Jesus' name. We'll be Perfect. praying in Jesus' name for all of eternity. And still, so he's still, he's still obviously the um, only way. Yeah. So for, for people born, or I guess tribulation saints that make it through, or people born in the millennium, they still have to pray differently in Jesus' name, to get to God to the Fa God the Father, not face to face though, like we would be in our redeemed bodies. Yep. Is that what you're saying? Yep. I mean, it makes sense. Yep. Here's an interesting question: The Jews are going to be sacrificing during the tribulation. Is God going to accept those sacrifices? I don't know that one. I don't think so, but I don't know. Well, here, this is an interesting point because the Jews still have seven years left of the 70th weeks, and they are under the law for seven more years. But here's the, here's the rub. The, they've already been set aside by God in, in, in the, because of their unbelief. He's going to bring them back in their unbelief. There's going to be some saved. Now, the value of those sacrifices is not intrinsic. There's no more value in those sacrifices than people see them pointing to Jesus on the cross. You don't see that, then the sacrifice is no value. So I think that God is not going to intrinsically accept any of the sacrifices in the tribulation time. He, no more than he, I mean, the Old Testament, he said, away with your sacrifices, your new moons and your feasts. They're a stench in my nostrils. Why were they a stench in his nostrils when he gave them to him? Well, they were a stench because they lived in their their unbelief and their wickedness and their hypocrisy. It'll be the same thing in the tribulation. But if, if a believer ex, uh, offers sacrifices who's trusting in the Messiah, or if a believer watches those and sees the picture of the Messiah, then they will be right for that person. They'll be accepted for that person. That makes sense. I like this. This is a great way to learn. Yeah. Oh, wow. Now we're people are asking hard questions now. What do you think of the spiritual gifts? And the spirit, now they're talking about a spiritual gifts test too. I'm not familiar with the spiritual gifts test. Are you familiar with it? Say that again. You cut out. The, the spiritual, spiritual gifts. Yeah. Um, and there's a test. It's They call it the spiritual gifts test. I, I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. I, I mean, I've seen those before. Um, man, my mind immediately goes to the John MacArthur thing of where you know those were only for up until i guess acts right and then when the when the apostles all died they the gifts went with them yep and especially you know some of the more outlandish ones that, that some people would say like speaking in tongues and healing the sick right yep i don't see how there could be any other reason i don't see why they're not i, I there's no good reason for me to believe that they aren't here 
What I do know is that people misuse them all the time. Yeah. So there is a real obfuscation. I think the enemy does that where people who don't know the word, they've never been coached in this. They, they just rattle off whatever. I'm not talking just about speaking tongues. I'm talking about the gifts Yep. because they don't know about them. But also I do know, like, for instance, if you're in a country where they outlaw following Jesus, how is he going to get to you? He shows up in a dream. He might use somebody's language and speak in a different language supernaturally. So, of course, the Lord is going to reach his people. I, I don't know how sometimes that played us out in American churchianity because we're a lot. Oftentimes we just. We, we don't know the word for a lot. And, you know, I don't know, but I don't think they went away. I just don't know how to use them all sometimes. What do you That's think? Right. Myself, too, I think that there were certain aspects that departed. We, you know, there's no apostles in the exact same sense. We had apostles. We have apostles in the secondary sense. You know, people that do church plants, people that do pioneer work, they're apostles. Missionaries are apostles. We don't have prophets in the same sense There's, that are speaking of thus saith the Lord, but they're prophets right. in the secondary sense who have a great deal of God-given discernment and wisdom, and they tear down and they build up. So we have that. And then when it comes, there's some of the supernatural manifestation aspects of the gifts. Um, there's, I wouldn't say there's a 100% retreat here. But there's been a, a vast retreat because if the purpose for the sign gifts has been fulfilled, then there's no more purpose for the sign gifts. However, what I've observed is the Lord oftentimes works in many miraculous and powerful ways. He's, he's still in the throne. He still answers prayer. He still works supernaturally. He's still a miracle worker. And I have had friends who, in fact, I still have them, who have been in amazing situations. These people do not identify as Pentecostals at all. The, 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 the Pentecostal movement makes them nervous because of the compromises and the extremes. So, But yet they've had experiences themselves that were supernatural. One time, one of my friends, who's now gone to be with the Lord, was preaching in a large audience in South Africa. He, he didn't know Afrikaans. He only spoke in English. And there was a guy in the audience that he'd been praying for for years, and this guy came up to him afterwards and said, I didn't know that you knew Afrikaans. And he says, I don't. Well, well you were preaching in it. You were preaching in flawless Afrikaans. Hmm. So he was, the people that, there that were in English heard him speak in English. And at least one person there heard him speaking in Afrikaans. Absolutely. I've and, heard of those stories. And, yeah. And so God still works miraculously. Totally. We want to be careful. We want to have discernment. We don't want to be uh, just being given to extremes on these kind of things. But we also want to be careful that we don't throw the, the baby out with the bathwater. God is still manifesting spiritual gifts. We may Absolutely. want to make a distinction between supernatural gifts and ministry gifts, but those gifts are still here. Absolutely. I totally agree. I can't justify why people would say he doesn't do them anymore. I'm like, why? Yep. Why? <laughs> well, I think one of the things that we do as human beings is we tend to extremes. Hmm. Uh, many of the, the great theological controversies that we face you have people lining up in a false dichotomy. So they're in the ditches on both sides of the road. That false dichotomy serves those two errors, but it does not serve the balanced truth in the middle. And somehow, by the grace of God, if we want to walk forward into sermon in the last days, we need to learn to recognize and avoid false dichotomies. Mm. You know, we get this when, when I'll just give you one that comes up all the time. People want to, they, they're opposed to legalism and they're opposed to, you know, uh, a, a works based gospel. So they're on the other side and they come up to this concept of grace where in their mind, um, 
you can be saved by grace and you're not supposed to look for evidence of life because that's works too. So you've got this false dichotomy going, but the fact of the matter is there's a balanced truth in the middle. I like yeah. to tell people, yep. you cannot, if you're trying to discern if there's evidence of life in somebody, you can't look for evidence of health. That's not fair. <laughs> um, Good point. Yeah, if a person, you pull a drowning victim out of a lake and he's only breathing three or four shallow breaths uh, a minute and his pulse is like 10 and he's half dead, well, he's still alive. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Yeah. My wife and I were talking about this the other day. I've just, we had, it, it, the, the extremes can be dangerous. I think maybe there's a call for them in scripture, but. There probably is, but living kind of the narrow road, it's kind of in the yeah. middle. It's not, not too far one way or the other, you know? That's right. Well, the Bible warns us not to stray to the left or the right. Mm. And the danger for zealous, devoted Christians is to stray to the right in reaction to the errors on the left. And so they will go on a path where they make rigorous rules for holy living. And they have rigorous tests. And those tests will wear on them. And they those tests will tire them out. And it will tire everyone that listens to them. If we need, if we learn how to walk in grace and, and be motivated by love, we'll find that we will actually attain higher heights of holiness and devotion by grace and love than you ever will by rules and regulations and standards. I always seem to me like you have man's version, you know, I always liked this definition. Religion is man's attempt to get to God. Yep. God's attempt to get to man is Jesus, right? Amen. There's a verse in Ecclesiastes, I was trying to find it, but um, basically saying how the unrighteous go left. <laughs> yeah. I always thought that was interesting. Go west as well. There's something to that. East goes evil, or evil goes east. West righteousness goes west. And there's a lot to that throughout history. I've noticed that over the years. You see that. Well, we're going to do two more quick questions, and then I got two lists of questions that we never got to. We'll just have to have you back on the show sometime so we can take up the rest of those questions. Love it. All right. How do you handle offenses? How would you recommend handling offenses within the family or within a, a group, whether it's like a band or whether maybe workmates? Man, I, I've, unfortunately, I've had my fair share of that. It's not fun. But over the years, I've learned that Proverbs is really good for that. I've had to learn this. A gentle answer turns away wrath. Amen. But a harsh word stirs up anger. Right. So that's Proverbs. And I've had to really take that to heart when dealing with people who want to accuse me or my wife or my kids or whatever. Um, you know, also to family, like you can weather those storms as family. And it, it's you just need to take some time and talk through it. I, I tend to, for me personally, if I'm angry, if my wife and I, are, we don't fight a lot. I, I, honestly, we don't. And you know when that started? Really, it was when she started, we both started studying God's word together we're just the fights just kind of evaporated but i usually take time to go and just go for a run or whatever take some time cool down uh, but a gentle answer turns away wrath i love yeah. that verse i always go back to god's word on that one that's Seems my to be a cure all yeah what's the healthy line between self-promoting work purposes and staying humble I think there's a great, again, Proverbs, let another praise you, not your own lips. Yeah, That's an excellent verse for anybody who has a platform or a, a real talent that's public. You know, music obviously is one of those, or athletics. Isn't it a joy when you see somebody who gives glory to the Lord? It is. Yep. It never gets old. Ever gets old, right? So I, I always appreciated that Proverbs, let another praise you, not your own lips, right? Amen. I've, I've found similar things, too. I just have to say, listen, I, I'm just going to focus on doing what God called me to do, and whatever happens, happens. Yeah, let I can't do focus it. on numbers. I can't focus on money. I can't focus on open doors here or there. I just 
whatever happens, happens. I, I have to be faithful to what God has given me to do. Absolutely. Yep. I always like the uh, the army, and you're a ranger, so you understand this better than I do, but until he gives you a new order, go at the last order. Amen. Amen. And we do have marching orders. Go into yep. all the world. Yep. Make disciples of all nations. Yep. Occupy. Rescue those trembling towards the fire. Right? right. Train up a child. All those. Everything. Absolutely. Amen. And someday the war is going to be over. And when that war is over... And you're on your free time when we're not in formal worship around the Lord. Your biggest choice of the day might be something as heavyweight as, uh, am I going to uh, brew a pot of Ethiopian Ergachef coffee today? Or am I going <laughs> to brew some Blue Jamaica Blue Diamond? I like Blue Jamaica too. I, I've been there. I like that. That's great. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Well, bro, I have really appreciated having you on tonight, and uh, it's been a great conversation. I We're going to have to have you on again in the near future. There's so much more we could talk about. We barely got started on prophecy, and there's just, and if you want to come on with some of your own questions too, that would be great. Oh, I have tons. I could go for hours easily. Amen. I love yeah. talking with you, Lee, because you you love God's word and you know it. I think your testimony of how you and Nita, you know, you sacrificed for many years so that you could study. Yeah. That is so inspiring to me. And you don't have a degree for it. I mean, you don't need one. But I think that's just really special. And praise the Lord that you, you were obedient to the calling on your heart all those years ago. And look at the fruit. I mean, I've been blessed by my wife and I and hopefully everybody here tonight, too. So praise the Lord for that, man. Amen. Now, I'm going to have you give a word of prayer, and we'll, we'll close the program down, but hang on, don't log out, because I want to chat with you for a few minutes when we're done. You got it. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a closing thought, and then I'll have you pray. Great. Folks, I want to thank you for coming on tonight. Uh, I want to thank my moderators, as always, for doing a great job. Without you, this job just doesn't go quite right. And I, I trust that all of you have been encouraged and blessed tonight. I was. I, I think there was a, some encouragement from Ben's testimony and just his excitement for the Word of God and for the work of God. Maybe we all take these things to heart. So, Ben, why don't you close us with a word of prayer? Happy to. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Lee and his inspiring testimony. Lord, we realize, we recognize that you are the giver of all gifts. You gave us the faith to follow you. You gave us the tools for which to do so. Lord, we pray for listeners tonight who are on this chat that are lost, angry, afraid, whatever it is. Lord, we, we ask humbly that you would use our testimonies pointing to your word to help rescue them from whatever they're dealing with. And Lord, but we also ask that you would inspire them to go to your word, the source of true life. Well, we, uh, we thank you for your word that says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it to the day of Christ Jesus, Philippians 1, 6. We believe that, Lord. We believe it from cover to cover. So in Jesus' name, Lord, we lift up you tonight. Uh, thank you for being our author and perfecter of our faith. In Jesus' name, continue to give Lee the brains he has in the new way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I thank you, everyone. Keep looking up. Uh, we're going to be flying soon to be with our Lord in the clouds. Amen. See you here, there, in the air. <laughs>